This morning, I'll be reading Chapter Five of Peter Pan, The Island Come True. Feeling that Peter was on his way back, the Neverland had again walked into life. In his absence, things were usually quiet on the island. The fairies take an hour longer in the morning. The beasts attend to their young. The redskins feed heavily. For six days and nights, and when pirates and lost boys meet, they merely bite their thumbs at each other. But with the coming of Peter, who hates lethargy, they are under way again. If you put your ear to the ground now, you would hear the whole island seething with life. On this evening, the lost boys were out looking for Peter. The pirates were out looking for the lost boys. The redskin were out looking for the pirates, and the bees were out looking for the redskins. They were going round and round the island, but they did not meet because all were going at the same rate. All wanted blood, except the boys, who liked it as a rule. But tonight, were out to greet their captain. The boys on the island vary, of course, in numbers according as they get liked. As they get killed and so on, and when they seem to be growing up, which is against the rules, Peter thins them out. But at this time, there were six of them, counting the twins. They are forbidden by Peter to look in the least like him, and they were the skins of the bear slain by themselves. The first to pass is Toodles. Not the least brave, but the most unfortunate of all that gallant band. He had been in fewer adventures than any of them, because the big things constantly happened just when he had stepped round the corner. This ill luck had given a gentle melancholy to his countenance, but instead of soaring his nature, had sweetened it so that he was quite the humblest of the boys. Poor kind Toodles, there is danger in the air for you tonight. Take care, lest an adventure is now offered you, which, if accepted, will plunge you in deepest woe. Toodles, the fairy Tink, who is bent on mischief this night, is looking for a tool, and she thinks you are the most easily tricked of the boys. Would that he could hear us, but we are not really on the island. And he passes by, biting his knuckles. Next come Nibs, the gay and debonair, followed by Slightly, who cuts whistles out the trees and dances ecstatically to his own tunes. Slightly is the most conceited of the boys. He thinks he remembers the days before he was lost, with their manners and custom, and this has given his nose an offensive tilt. Curly is fourth. He is a pickle, and so often has he had to deliver up his person when Peter said sternly, "Stand forth, the one who did this thing." That now at the command he stands forth automatically, whether he had done it or not. Last come the twins, who cannot be described because we should be sure to be describing the wrong one. Peter never quite knew what twins were. And his band were not allowed to know anything he did not know, so there. So these two were always vague about themselves and did their best to give satisfaction by keeping close together in an apologetic sort of way. The boys vanished in the gloom, and after a pause, but not a long pause, for things go briskly on the island. Come the pirates on their track, a more villainous-looking lot never hung. In a row on execution dock, here a little in advance is the handsome Italian Kecko, who cut his name in letters of blood on the back of the governor of the prison at Gao. That gigantic black behind him has had many names since he dropped the one with which dusky mothers still terrify their children on the banks of the Gaujamo. Here is Bilk Juice, every inch of him tattooed. The same Bilk Juice who got six dozen on the walls from Flint and Cookson, said to be Black's Murphy brother and Gentleman Storkey, 
once an usher in a public school, and so dainty in his ways of killing and skylights, and the Irish Bonsam Smee, an oddly genial man who stabbed, so to speak, without offence, a noodler whose hands were fixed on backwards and robbed Mullins and Aff Mason and many. Another ruffian, long known and feared on the Spanish main, in the midst of them, the blackest and largest in that dark setting, reclined James Hook, or as he wrote himself, Das Hook, of whom it is said he was the only man that the sea cook feared. He lay at his ease in a rough chariot drawn and propelled by his men, and instead of a right hand. He had the iron hook with which ever and anon he encouraged them to increase their pace, as dogs this terrible man treated and addressed them, and as dogs they obeyed him. In person he was carvedendrous and black cavus, and his hair was dressed in long curls, which at a little distance looked like black candles, and gave a singularly threatening expression. To his handsome countenance, his eyes were of the blue of the forget-me-not, and of a profound melancholy. Save when he was plunging his hook into you, at which time two red spots appeared in them and lit them up horribly. In manner, something of the grand seigneur still clung to him, so that he even ripped you up with an air. And I have been told that he was a recounter. Storyteller of repute, he was never more sinister than when he was most polite, which is probably the truest test of breeding and the elegance of his diction. Even when he was squaring, no less than the distinction of his demeanor showed him one of the different, one of a different cast from his crew, a man of indomitable courage. It was said that which was thick and of an unusual color. In dress, he was somewhat a pet. The attire associated with the name of Charles II, having heard it was said in some earlier period of his career that he bore a strange resemblance to the ill-fated Stuarts, and in his mouth he had a holder of his own contrivance which enabled him to smoke two cigars at once. But undoubtedly, the grimmest part of him was his iron claw. Let us now kill a pirate to show Hook's method. Skylights will do. As they pass, Skylights lurches clumsily against him, ruffling his lace collar. The hook shoots forth. There is a tearing sound and one screech. Then the body is kicked aside, and the pirates pass on. He has not even taken the cigars from his mouth. Such is the terrible man against whom Peter Pan is pitted. Which will win? On the trail of the pirates, stealing noiselessly down the war path, come the red skin. Every one of them, with his eyes peeled, they carry tomahawks and knives, and their naked bodies gleam with paint and oil. Strung around them are scalps of boys as well as pirates, as the pirates, for these are the Piccaninny tribe. And not to be confused with the softer, hearted Delawares or the Hurons, in the van on all fours is great big little Panther, a brave of so many scalps that in his present position they somewhat impede his progress, bringing up the rear the place of greater danger comes Tiger Lily, profoundly erect, a princess in her own right. She is the most beautiful of dusky Dianas, goddess of the woods, and the belle of the Pekinis. There is not a brave who would of who a, there is not a brave who would not have the wayward things to wife. But she staves off the altar with a hatchet. Observe how they pass over fallen twigs without making the slightest noise. The only sound to be heard is their somewhat heavy breathing. The fact is that they are all a little fat just now after the heavy gorging, but in time they will work this off. For the moment, however, it constitutes their chief danger. 
the redskin disappear as they have come like shadows, and soon their place is taken by the beast. A great and motley procession: lions, tigers, bears, and the innumerable smaller savage things that flee from them. For every kind of beast, and more particularly old man eaters, live cheek by jowl on the favored island. Their tongues are hanging out. They're not hungry. They are hungry tonight. When they have passed, comes the last figure of all: a gigantic crocodile. We shall see for whom she is looking presently. The crocodile passes, but soon the boys appear again. For the procession must continue indefinitely until one of the parties stops or changes its pace. Then quickly they will be on top of each other. All are keeping a sharp look out in front, but none suspects that the danger may be creeping up from behind. This shows how real the island was. The first to fall out of the moving circle was the boys. They flung themselves down on the sward, close to their underground home. I do wish Peter would come back. Every one of them said nervously, though in height and still more in breadth, they were all larger than their captain. I am the only one who is not afraid of the pirates," slightly said in the tone that prevented his being a general favorite. But perhaps some distant sound disturbed him. For he added hastily, "But I wish he would come back and tell us whether he has heard anything more about Cinderella." They talked of Cinderella, and Toodles was confident that his mother must have been very like her. It was only in Peter's absence that they could speak of mothers, the subject being forbidden by him as silly. All I remember about my mother, Nibs told them, is that she often said to my father. Oh how I wish I had a checkbook of my own! I don't know what a checkbook is, but I should just love to give my mother one. While they talked, they heard a distant sound. At once, the lost boys. But where are they? They are no longer there. Rabbits could not have disappeared more quickly. I wish. I will tell you where they are, with the exception of Nibs. Who has started a way to reconnoit? To reconnoit, they are already in their home under the ground, a very delightful residence of which we shall see a good deal presently. But how have they reached it? For there is no entrance to be seen, not so much as a large stone, which, if rolled away, would disclose the mouth of a cave. Look closely, however, and you may note that there are here seven large trees, each with a hole in its hollow trunk as large as a boy. These are the seven entrances to the home under the ground, for which Hook has been searching in vain there many moons. Will he find it tonight? As the parrot advances, the quick eyes of Starkey sighted Nibs disappearing through the wood. And at once, his pistol flashed out. But an iron claw gripped his shoulder. "Captain, let go!" he cried, withering. Now, for the first time, we hear the voice of Hook. It was a black voice. "Put back that pistol first," it said threateningly. Threateningly, it was one of those boys you hate. I could have shot him dead. A this and the sound would have brought tiger lilies redskin upon us. Do you want to lose your scalp? Shall I after him, Captain? Ask pathetic Smee and tickle him with Johnny Cox corkscrew. Not now, Smee. Hook said darkly. He has only one, and I want to mischief all the seven. Scatter and look for them. The pirates disappeared among the trees. In a moment, their captain and Smee were alone. Hook heaved a heavy sigh, and I know not why it was. Perhaps it was because of the soft beauty of the evening. But there came over him a desire to confide to his faithful boss in the story of his life. He spoke long and earnestly, but what it was all about Smee, who was rather stupid, but did not know in the least. Most of all. Hook was saying passionately, 
I want their captain, Peter Pan. Twice he cut off my arm. He brandished the hook threateningly. I've waited long to shake his head with this. Oh, I'll tear him. And yet, said Smee, I've often heard you say the hook was worth of a score of hands for combing the hair and other homely uses. A, the captain answered, if I was a mother, I would pray to have my children born with this instead of that. And he cast a look of pride upon his iron hand and one of scorn upon the other. Then again, he frowned. Peter flung my arm, he said wincing, to a crocodile that happened to be passing by. I have often, said Smee, noticed your strange dread of crocodiles. Not of crocodiles, he corrected him, but of that one crocodile, he lowered his voice. It liked my arm so much, Smee, that it has followed me ever since, from sea to sea, from land to land, licking its lips for the rest of me. He sat down on a large mushroom, and now there was a quiver in his voice. Smee, he said huskily, that crocodile would have had me before this, but by a lucky chance, it swallowed a clock which goes tick, tick inside it. So before it can reach me, I can hear the tick and bolt, he laughed, but in a hollow way. Someday, said Smee, the clock will run down and then he'll get you. Hook wetted his dry lips. Hey, he said, that's the fear that haunts me. Since sitting down, he had felt curiously warm. Smee, he said, this seat is hot. He jumped up. Odds bobs, hammer, and tongs are burning. They examined the mushroom, which was of a size and solidity unknown on the mainland. They tried to pull up, and it came away at once in their hands, for it had not, for it had no root. Stranger still, smoke began at once to ascend. The pirates looked at each other. A chimney, they both exclaimed. They had indeed discovered the chimney of the home under the ground. It was the custom of the boys to stop it with a mushroom when enemies were in the neighborhood. Not only smoke came out of it, there came only also children's voices. For so face safe did the boys feel in their hiding place that they were gaily chattering. The pirates listened grimly and then replaced the mushroom. They looked around them and noted the holes in the seven trees. Did you hear them say Peter Pan's from home? Smee whispered, fidgeting with Johnny, Johnny Corkscrew. Hook nodded. He stood for a long time lost in thought. And at last, a curdling smile lit up his worthy face. Smee had been waiting for it. Unripped your plan, Captain, he cried eagerly. To return to the ship, Hook replied slowly through his teeth and cook a large, rich cake of a jolly thickness with green sugar on it. There can be but one room below, for there is but one chimney. We will leave the cake on the shore of the mermaid's lagoon. These boys are always swimming about there, playing with the mermaids. They will find the cake. And they will gobble it up because having no mother, they don't know how dangerous this to each rich damn cake. Aha, they will die. Smee had listened with growing admiration. It's the wickedest, prettiest policy I ever, ever I heard of. Another sound broken and stilled them. There was at first such a tiny sound that a leaf might have fallen on it and smothered it. As it came nearer, it was more distinct. Tick. Tick, tick. Hulk stood shuddering, one foot in the air. The crocodile, he gasped and bowed away, followed by his bosom. It was indeed the crocodile. It had passed the redskin, who were now on the trail of the other pirates. It oozes on after Hook. Once more, the boys emerged into the open. But the dangers of the night were not yet over. For presently, Nibs rushed breathless into their midst, pursued by a pack of wolves. The tongues of the pursuers were hanging out. The baying of them was horrible. Save me, save me, cried Nibs, falling on the ground. But what can we do? What can we do? What would Peter do? They cried simultaneously. Almost in the same breath, they cried. Peter would look at them through his legs. 
it is quite the most successful way of defying wolves. And as one boy, they bent and looked through their legs. The next moment is the long one. But victory came quickly. For as the boys advanced upon them in a terrible attitude, the wolves dropped their tails and fled. Now, Niv rose from the ground, and the others thought that his staring eyes, staring eyes still saw the wolves. But it was not wolves he saw. I have seen a wonderful thing, he cried, as they gathered around him eagerly. A great white bird. It is flying this way. What kind of bird do you think? I don't know. Nib said, awestruck. But it looks so wary, and it and and it, as it flies, it moans. Poor Wendy, poor Wendy. I remember," said slightly instantly. "There are birds called Wendies. See, it comes!" cried Curly, pointing to Wendy in the heavens. Wendy was now almost overhead, and they could hear her plaintive cry. But the more distinct came the shrill voice of Tinker Bell. The jealous, the jealous fairy had now cast off all the skies of friendship, and was darting at her victim from every direction, pinching savagely each time she touched. "Hello, Tink!" cried the wondering boys. Tink replied, "Rang out. Peter wants you to shoot the Wendy." It was not in their nature to question when Peter ordered. "Let us do what Peter wishes!" cried the simple boy. "Quick, bows and arrows!" All but Toodles popped down their trees. He had a bow and arrow with him, and Ting noted it, and rubbed her little hands. "Quick, Toodles, quick!" she screamed. "Peter will be so pleased." Toodles excitedly fitted the arrows to his bow. "One of the way, Ting!" He sh out the way, Ting! He shouted, and then he fired, and Wendy fluttered to the ground with an arrow in her breast. Okay, so. When you get shot, and that's the end of chapter five. The next chapter will be the little house. Bye.